Good afternoon. It is uh, truly an honor for me to be back in Brazil to see many of my good friends. Uh, it's an honor for me to present at this important conference. The topic I've chosen to talk to you about today is what we are calling the NFPA Fire and Life Safety Ecosystem. Over, the, over our 122 years of history as a nonprofit, non-government organization, NFPA has been focused on eliminating fire deaths and injuries, or deaths and injuries due to fires, electrical, and related hazards. And we do that through sharing knowledge and information, whether it's our codes and standards, research, training, or public education. But unfortunately, most people do not realize how complex the fire problem really is. So for the last two years, we've been spending time trying to build a way that can visualize and explain the complexity of the fire problem to develop a tool that can help organizations, governments, and industry identify where their critical fire issues are and then move forward to solving that. So I'm going to be talking about this fire and life safety ecosystem that has eight components. And I'll talk about each one individually and then how each plays a really, really critical role in protecting people and property. So as I mentioned, NFPA is 122 years old. We are a nonprofit membership organization and we develop over 300 consensus codes and standards <clears throat> that are used throughout the world. Those standards range from building and life safety to electrical to the uh, fire protection systems that go into buildings to the management and control of dangerous goods, hazardous materials, and dangerous processes of fire department organization, training, occupational health and safety, and professional qualifications, and community risk reduction and disaster and business continuity standards. Our standards are translated into 13 different languages. Uh, and everyone in this room can be a part of our standards process. So I would urge you to take a look at our website it's very easy to contribute a recommendation or a suggestion or an input into what should be in the standards. And they are updated every three to five years through a very open and transparent process of technical committee work. Now let's get back to the ecosystem for a minute. It's really critical that we, countries, governments, policymakers, strive to attain each one of these uh, levels of, of safety in the ecosystem. And we'll talk about uh, the critical aspects of that in just a moment. But let me touch for a minute on today's fire problem, which I know Catherine mentioned a minute ago. But in the US, we have 3,000 fire deaths per year. Those deaths occur in mostly in single family residential structures in homes, but we also have a problem with industrial fires, with forest fires, and I don't think we're very much different from Brazil when we look at our fire problem in terms of forest fires, residential fires, industrial fires. I know you had a very tragic incident uh, several weeks ago with the loss of your national museum. And as I talk about the ecosystem, I hope that you'll think about not only ways that you can move forward on improving your ecosystem here, but where are the failure points? Where, where can there be improvement? And there's one statistic that we're really grappling with, uh, and that's the number of fire deaths worldwide. And I know you had a number of 15,000 deaths. 
Uh, there aren't a lot of good fire data systems in many countries, but we actually think that that number is actually quite higher. We've heard numbers from anything from 150,000 to 300,000 fire deaths per year. Regardless of what it, the actual number is, it is far too many. And it's far too many when you consider that more people die in fires around the world every year than die in wars. And that's a very, very scary number. So why is this fire problem happening? Well, it's happening because there may not be a strong regulatory policy. There may not be the latest codes and standards in effect. The public may not be well informed. There may not be a trained and skilled workforce that knows how to design, install, and maintain fire protection systems. And there may not be uh, an incentive from a financial perspective, from an insurance loss perspective, to ensure that there's no fire safety uh, features in play. So what's your role in the, in the fire safety ecosystem? Well, it's everyone's responsibility. You have your individual roles in your job, whether it's being a firefighter, whether it's being an engineer, a technician, but we all are members of the public. We all can influence the ecosystem in varying ways. So I want you to think about what your role is in this ecosystem as I go through this presentation. So first up, let's talk about the government and the responsibility of government. Government's responsibility to maintain an effective policy and regulatory environment that supports fire, electrical, building, and life safety. We've actually done some polls of the general public to find out what their expectations are of government's roles. And we find something actually isn't too surprising, but I think it's been surprising to many politicians that the public expects that government is thinking of fire safety as a priority, the government is ensuring that the latest codes are in play, and that when someone walks into a building, such as this university building, a restaurant, moves into a new apartment, there is an expectation in their mind that it's going to be safe because someone in the government is looking out for them. Now, we all know that that's not necessarily true. In the U.S., there are tremendous efforts underway to uh, make codes and standards less effective, to delay the uh, enforcement and adoption of the latest standards, and there are, is undue influence by special interest groups to pressure government not to require fire safety as a priority. And that's a very scary thing because we're seeing a deterioration of our ecosystem in the United States. Secondly, and as mentioned this, is the importance of developing and using current codes. Using the latest codes and standards developed by experts from across the world to establish the minimum levels of safety to protect people and property is critical. Now, I'm always asked about new standards, and the assumption is that a new standard or new code is going to be more restrictive. It's going to cost more. And that's not necessarily the case. In many instances, it's not the case at all, because the latest codes incorporate the use of new technologies. They allow more flexibility in design and allow for better design options and choices for the designer, for the installer. And the use of new technology is critical in terms of economic growth. I'm also asked often is, what is it that, um, if you excuse me just a minute, it's a little warmer here than it is in Boston. It's going to be zero at my house tonight, and it's a little warmer here. 
So what, what is it that results in changes to codes? Now, the most obvious one is a catastrophic event occurs, something we didn't think about in the code that we should address. So uh, we've had nightclub fires, disco fires in the US. You've had them here in Brazil. We made changes to our codes as a result of those fires. But that's not the, real, the most frequent reason why codes and standards change. They change, as I mentioned, because of the need to incorporate new technology and new design methodologies. Ideally, they change because of research. Research looking proactively, looking into the future, anticipating what fire safety problems might occur because of certain technologies, certain types of building materials, certain methodologies will cause fire problems in the future. Anticipate those before they happen so that we're not doing the code change after people have died, after buildings have burned. And then the final reason is society may change what it perceives as an acceptable level of risk. Society may decide that we want to be safer or we want to be less safe. Uh, so that can go actually either way. But those are the reasons why codes and standards change. So let's talk a little bit about reference standards. So what are reference standards? Well, you have a, a basic fire code or a building code, and integrated into that is language that would refer you to other documents, whether it's a NFPA standard, a UL standard, a SEN standard, that would gives the designer and the installer the guidance on the specific details of what products are acceptable, what design criteria must be, must be used. So for example, in an NFPA standard, we might require a one hour fire resisted rated wall and a door in a certain type of occupancy. We don't tell you how to design that wall or what are the components of that door. We would refer you to a UL standard or another standard that would specify exactly how that's done and how the testing should be done for that. So reference standards are critical component of a building and fire code and must be followed the same as you follow the, the originating language in the master code. So investment and in safety. This is perfect segue to the question that was asked earlier about cost. Um, safety should, and this is our job to convince them of that, should always be everyone's high priority. We all have to work together. This is a public sector responsibility, the government, the fire service. It's the NGOs, like NFPA, have a responsibility. And certainly the private sector has a responsibility. Architects, engineers, contractors, installers. It's economically uh, important to maintain safety as a priority. And it's certainly an obligation to the public to maintain safety as a priority. We know that tragedies will occur, but investments in fire safety and in training, skills, inspection, testing, maintenance, and vigilance are all part of that, that investment. It's, no, it's, it's not by accident that many of the largest companies in the world invest millions and millions and millions of dollars in safety. They recognize it as an important part of reducing risk for their corporation. It reduces their, improves their public profile because they certainly don't want to see employees or the public die from fires that they may have caused. And the same applies to smaller organizations uh, and sm small companies as well. Now, skilled workforce. And this is really critical. It's really essential that we provide opportunities for professionals to apply the skills that they have 
and to also offer training when they need it, reward those who commit to fire protection and education. Promoting the development and utilizing skilled professionals is a critical part of the fire safety ecosystem. Fire safety systems, as you heard earlier, are very complex. Inspection, testing, and maintenance must be done continually through the life of a building. So let alone the design and proper installation, but inspection, testing, and maintenance by a skilled, a skilled workforce is absolutely critical. And I want to give you two examples, one a success and one a failure about a skilled workforce. So the success story actually comes as a result of a tragedy in Boston, Massachusetts. Several years ago, there was a, a building fire caused by two workers on the outside of the building that were using a torch to weld a railing on a staircase. They weren't, were not using proper procedures and the fire spread into the building. The fire department responded. Uh, as a result of that fire, two firefighters were killed. As a result of that, the city of Boston partnered with NFPA to, to develop a hot works training program that is mandatory for anyone doing hot work or welding in the city of Boston. That program has now been expanded to the uh, entire state of Massachusetts, and we're getting to, ready to launch that nationally in the U.S. with the hope that we can re reduce or even eliminate fires from improper hot work procedures, in particular fires that occur in buildings under construction. So although it happened as a result of a tragedy, that's the success story. The failure is something I observed when I was in Bangladesh several years ago. You'll recall that they had a series of fires and building collapses involving the garment industry. And we were asked to participate in an initiative to educate building owners, factory operators, and employees, the garment workers, on fire safety, and to help the government develop a new fire code. One of the first steps that they took was requiring factories to install fire doors. And that's basically what the government said, install fire doors. They didn't provide guidance on that. So at one site I visited, I observed there was a, a fire door in an opening, but it was not a fire door that had been tested or labeled or listed as Catherine mentioned the importance of that with products. So it was not an approved type of fire door, so it, it really wouldn't work. But the other problem was this fire door, this wide, was installed in an opening that was this wide. So there was a very nice fire door, but you could, you could walk back and forth. Now what did that tell me? It told me that people did not understand the concept of, of fire safety and fire behavior. They had not been trained on that. They were simply following the instruction to install a fire door. So that's a great example of a failure uh, that could, can be overcome by having a skilled and trained workforce. Now the big one, conformance. Conformance with the code. I spent many years as a fire inspector and a fire prevention officer and a state fire marshal, which meant uh, I had responsibility for the code enforcement, investigations, uh, and public education. And one of the things that I learned quickly is code compliance is 95% education, and about 5% where you're really uh, taking enforcement actions, taking someone to court because they failed to comply. And my inspectors and my team were always working closely with property owners, with architects, engineers, to, to tell the message, to tell the story 
of why fire safety is important, how do you comply, this is how the code works, this is what needs to be done. And it was always amazing to me how much more successful we were with that approach of getting people to voluntarily comply, to be part of the team, to be part of the ecosystem. But you still need resources to do code compliance. The government needs to fund the inspectors. They need to fund an effective plan review process that doesn't delay the review of plans, which doesn't delay construction or renovation projects. And there has to be a process of monitoring buildings through their entire life cycle. It starts with the design, continues with the construction, the inspection, testing, and maintenance of the building throughout its life. And then, of course, if it ends up either falling down, burning down, or being torn down at the end, safety is still a critical piece of that. We're having an epidemic in the U.S. of fires in buildings that are under construction. These are usually wood frame buildings, and, and we're getting larger and larger buildings being built out of wood. But the failure to follow good fire safe practices during the construction of building allows for both accidental fires and arson fires. And we've had catastrophic events that have not only affected the building where the fire occurs, but has been, have been such large fires that they've destroyed entire, entire neighborhoods. So that continues to be a challenge. Two more pieces in the ecosystem to talk about. Preparedness and emergency response. A critical component of community risk reduction and for life saving and property protection is the work of the fire brigade. The fire brigade has really two roles. One, as we mentioned, this prevention role of plans review, code compliance, inspection and monitoring. But the fire brigade, the fire department, is that last resource, that last line of defense when all the other pieces of the ecosystem have failed, or even if one piece of the ecosystem has failed. So today we're asking our first responders to do many, many things. You know, when I, when I joined the fire department many, many years ago, my job was basically to go put out fires. Today, it's rescue from high, high places. It's rescue from swift water. It's hazardous materials response, forest firefighting, high rises, hazardous materials, chemicals, uh, terrorism, active shooter incidents, medical emergencies, all types of rescues. The fire department has a huge portfolio of responsibility. And it's critical that they be funded properly, staffed properly, and trained properly in order to perform their critical piece of the fire and life safety ecosystem. And the last piece, again, that's where we all come in once again together, and that's an informed public. It means raising awareness, providing the resources and educating the public of all ages about the changes, about the, the challenges posed and dangers posed by fire, electrical, and related hazards. The goal here is to not only enable the public to make better and more uh, better informed decisions about their personal safety, not just at home, but at work, at play, uh, anywhere they happen to be. And we have a huge challenge in this area because we're now in the information age. We're all getting bombarded with videos, with tweets, with texts, Everything is coming at us all at once. How do we, as fire safety uh, advocates, get to the public with information? We have to use the same 
methodologies. I know at NFPA we're trying to change things very quickly, start using social media, uh, videos, Facebook, YouTube, all those things to get the message out. But we still find that one of the most effective ways to get to the public is through children. Teaching children about fire safety, not only will hopefully they'll grow up with good fire safety practices in mind, but they take those measures home, those ideas home, and make sure that there's working smoke alarms, that there's a fire escape drill, that there aren't other kinds of dangerous activities going on in the home. And that's, that's really critical, and that's some, a role that we can all play. So when we put it all together, what we find is that no single entity, no single person, no single organization can prevent a fire or disaster from occurring, and there's certainly no single answer. It's a complex problem, but if we work together, if we look at these components individually and together, I think it's possible to develop priorities, assess where the weakest links are, explain the complexity of fire safety, and then follow our tagline on the bottom, which is, it's a big world, let's protect it together. Now, we didn't come up with that just to be cute. We call it a call to action. And I invite every single one of you in this room, every one of your colleagues, to join us, because it is a big world, and if we're going to protect it from fire, we do indeed have to do it together. So in closing, I'd like you to think about what your role is in the fire safety ecosystem, how you can possibly use this concept as you do your daily work, um, as you uh, encourage government to play a, a stronger role in this, as you talk to your bosses about risk reduction, uh, and as you talk to your families about fire safety. So my colleague Anderson has a, a card uh, with this information on it. We'll distribute this this afternoon so everybody can go home with that. And uh, I want to thank you again, once again, for the opportunity to be here, and happy to answer any questions.